Welcome, everybody. This is Bert Soren with the Be Legendary podcast by Sorenex. Um, today, I have an absolute legend in the strength conditioning field. I have someone who I've considered a hero, and many of us should if we're in the strength conditioning world, but also has been a mentor to me, has been a customer, has been a friend, has been someone I've looked up to uh, in the industry, and that's uh, Coach Johnny Parker. And Johnny, welcome to the show, and, and just it's awesome to get to see you again, sir. Bert, thank you very much. Likewise, and I was, from then to, I was wondering who you were introducing. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. You're, you're, always, you're always so humble. Um, so I wanted to, first of all, give a little bit of an intro to those who have lived under a rock in the strength world for the last 20 or 30 years, or maybe they're just new to it. And that's, that's great. We're getting some new blood in the strength world. But uh, and you and I talked, I, in no disrespect in any way, but I wanted to kind of give a cursory of who you are in your story, but really I wanted to dive into some stuff that maybe not everyone knew to get an insight because I believe that the gold that you and, and a few of your contemporaries, the Al Millers and the Alvar Meals and guys like that, you were there at the early days. I consider you somewhat the first generation of strength coaches that the rest of this industry has been built upon. And the reality of it is, unfortunately, we're not gonna have gentlemen like you with us forever. And I wanna make sure that, that your gold is, is preserved for, for strength coaches and strength enthusiasts for years to come. Thank you very much. And if we won't be together forever, where are you going? <laughs> well, I'm going to go to lunch after this. <laughs> well, uh, so, so Johnny, of course, uh, you know, I was, I was looking and, and I'm in South Carolina. You were born in Greenville, South Carolina. Is that right? I sure was. And I'm sitting in a rocking chair right now from my mama's home in Woodruff. And oh, his, yeah. chair, his chair is probably a hundred years old. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, and about my age. <laughs> and you're you're the you're the, the consummate southern gentleman i mean i know you spent a lot of time in mississippi um and, and been in the strength world for 30 to 40 years i mean i would say since you were a young man um and not only have you coached i know at the high school level i was looking back into you know the old miss the lsu indiana and even for my it's my south carolina gamecocks i believe right around the, the mid 70s is that right yes sir yes sir yes sir and so that's amazing. But then I think you really cut your teeth and, and really, I, I would say probably really put your name on the, on the board of legends in the NFL. And from what I understand, I know you coached uh, the Giants, Patriots, Bucks, and the 49ers. Were there a few more teams in there? I'm sure there probably were. Nope. That's nope. enough. Yeah, that's enough. Uh, two Super Bowl vic victories. No, whoa, 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 whoa. If we're going to – if we're going to say stuff, let's get it right. Yeah, see, I wanted to see if you were sleeping yet. <laughs> <laughs> Three. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, we, were, we were working together uh, with equipment for you guys <laughs> when you were with the Bucks. That was your, your last Super Bowl victory. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Yep. And uh, an awesome. And some of the stuff I want to ask you about was some of the things that I enjoyed seeing during that time. So I guess – like I said, you're, you're a name, you're a force, you're, you're a building block in the strength and conditioning world. Uh, and so I, would, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell more of your story if you'd like to, but also maybe some more insight that you've garnered through, through, through the industry that you've been so instrumental and in that you've loved. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start off if there, unless there's something else that you want to weigh in on your, your history and kind of uh, that, that cursory overlook of who Johnny Parker is. Okay. Fire away. Yes, sir. Okay. So I think one of the first things, you know, you're a legend, uh, now in the strength world, <clears throat> what were you thinking when you got into the strength and conditioning world of, and, and was there really a strength and conditioning world at that time? What were you thinking at that time as a young, as a young coach deciding to, to really involve yourself in weightlifting at that point? Well, first of all, when uh, we started lifting weights as a high school coach, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, we did that because I knew that was the only way that I had even been a 
decent high school player, and that's about all I was. But I just thought that that might help some of my kids uh, have greater success in football, the team have more success, and that maybe some players would uh, have a chance to get an, a free education because of football. But they need to be big enough and powerful enough mm -hmm. you know, for the colleges to be interested in them. And sure enough, our last team, 13 out of 34, eventually played college football. Wow. Some level. Wow. Now, what caused you to go down that route? You said you'd had some experience weightlifting in high school. Did you have a mentor there that got you started? What was the, the turning factor to you said, this is valuable. This is something I need to, to be involved in. First of all, mom and daddy got me a set of weights for Christmas, my ninth grade year. And in the little instruction book, you had to weigh and measure yourself. I was 5'11", and either 100 or 105, some one of the <laughs> two, I can't remember which. <laughs> Needless to say, I was not on the cover of you know, any magazines or any, uh, right. any muscle magazines. Uh, but there was a coach named Richard Hamberlin who had a set of weights in his backyard. Okay. And he had me and several other boys come over and work out. He would supervise us. And Bert, I was so weak, I had to have uh, uh, assistance with the bar on a bunch of exercises. <laughs> but through working out, I gained about 75 pounds in high school. Wow. And uh, I'm, I'm missing your. That's Alvaro Mill calling. Okay. Anyway, uh, then in college, I saw what recruiting was like, and I didn't like the disparity in the relationship between the position coaches and the starters and the down-the-line guys. I did not like that. Okay. I thought that everybody's dream was important. Mm. And whether they were good enough to make it come true or not is irrelevant to me. Sure. I had to do everything I could to help make their dream come true. And I couldn't do that, I didn't think, as a position coach. I wanted wow. to do that uh, where I was kind of on my own and I could do things the way I wanted to, where everybody was important. So wow. that just led me to the weight room. Got it. So, so your job really became a, a potential optimizer through through the tools of weightlifting. I think that's a great way of putting it. I never thought of a big word like that, but yes, <laughs> the way I looked at it was, Bert, that I had their dream in my hand. Right. And it was up to me to do everything I could to help make their dream come true. That's, and, that's and the way sure I did it. And you sure did it. Congratulations. And mission accomplished. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Bert. And as you, as you know, although you were never third string, oh, yeah. a, a third <laughs> string player's dream is as important as a star's. Uh, 100% coach. I mean, you know, I had a pretty decent career athletically in college, but I was a non, I was a non-recruited walk-on. Um, you know, I was 172 pounds, six feet two walking into college at 17 years old, trying to be a SEC division one level thrower. And that's not exactly the recipe for that. So it was through the strength game, strength coaches and, and my, my throwing position coach, it gave me that same potential and and that's why i'm still so in love with the weight room because it it built basically every everything that i am and everything i became was the hard work in the weight room and that that gave me potential to one day be an all-american or a team captain or sec champion or whatever it was it was all weight room related so i i i would have loved to have you as my coach we would have got uh, you, hey you did great without me <laughs> oh i appreciate it so so that was kind of the origin. And so give us a little bit of an idea of time-wise. I would assume that was in the mid to early 60s. And, and what was the landscape of strength conditioning or weightlifting at that time? Was it, I know from what I talked to Pops, it was pretty rare because even when he came to University of South Carolina in 1968, he said there were no weights here. He said there was one rusty barbell stuck in beside the track that was halfway squished down into the ground. And there was a universal machine in the Russell house. He said that was all that was there. And, you know, so I bet, you know, 
fast uh, reverse it four or five years prior to that, I would think people looked at you like you're on the moon if you were talking about athletes weightlifting. Well, uh, Bert, there was a generation, a small one before me and uh, the two Owls and other guys of our era, Alvin Roy, who's the father of the profession. Yes, sir. Ruth Ricky and Clyde Emrick. Mm -hmm. And luckily, those guys treated me like I was somebody, even though I was just a podunk coach at a little podunk high school in Mississippi. And they were so influential in my career. Yeah. And and looking back, I know I asked them so many dumb questions, and yet they never treated me like I was dumb. And they were a great inspiration and a great impact on me. I could have just as easily uh, maybe have been influenced by somebody who was machine oriented and thought that that was the way to go. But luckily, those men were you know, all free weights. And mm -hmm. that's what I've done ever since. And I'm so thankful for those three men. Absolutely. Well, Clyde Emmerich was quite the weightlifter uh, in his day. And I don't believe Lou Ricky was an Olympian or, or right at that level in weightlifting. Yes, he was. Well, right? Mr. Ricky, Mr. Ricky snatched 325 at 181. And wow. I, I believe he was either the last or next to last American to set a world record. Wow. Lifting. But wow. a great man, great oh, man. man. And, and you know, and, and kind of to, to kind of click forward a little bit, when we did the room for you, I know when dad was designing it, I know you and he had some long drawn out conversations and even some design work. And I remember you either set him up or I remember Pops found Lou Ricky and got the designs for the original Ricky rack that you yes. wanted. And again, that was 18 years ago or so. So I'm trying to remember the Ricky rack was one of my notes that I wanted to ask you about. What what did you see in that? And give us a little bit of the history because I think that was such an interesting piece. And it was it was when I was first getting into the industry and I fully didn't understand. It almost seemed like it was a a predecessor, really almost to a Smith machine. Yeah, what absolutely. was the value of that? Absolutely. Mr. Ricky was a weightlifter, but you know, he didn't live at the gym. Right. And he had to figure out a way that he could work out without spotters. Okay. And he came up, he had, I believe, a man named John Gurgot came up with this design. And you're right, it is a, you know, a, I guess you can say simplified Smith machine. Mm -hmm. or it was a predecessor. And um, I always had those. I first learned of them from Mr. Roy. He oh, had them everywhere that he went, and he called them a sleeve rack. Okay, yeah, because they had just like a sleeve that slid up and down and like a, a piece of wood where you slam the, the pegs through, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Mr. Ricky in his weight room with the Steelers, that's all they had. They had 10 of those. Wow. So um, I just thought it was the next best thing to a free weight uh, for guys that had, <clears throat> while you were trying to make them more flexible, or whatever, or they had some type of injury, uh, we got a lot of use out of those. Right. A lot. If they were, while we will say, you know, a lot of kids have are not flexible enough to squat. Well, yeah. that was a way of squatting with pretty good weight while we were on the also on the side working on their functional flexibility so they could squat with a free weight. Right. So that was something that you utilized throughout your career. Absolutely. Absolutely. Level. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I could still probably look back and find those uh, those wax paper drawings that we had uh, that, that Mr. Ricky had sent us and, and we built for you. And I remember actually to speak to that, I remember that room uh, at Tampa Bay specifically, there was a lot of things that I learned and a lot of questions that I still have based on your your method to, I wouldn't say madness, but almost with, with geniusness and Obviously, for those who haven't watched the game recently, you know, it seemed like you guys were kind of counted out that whole season and you absolutely trounced the, the Oakland Raiders that that year. The Super Bowl was and remember, I was so excited because I kept talking about how physical of a team you guys were and just how physical dominating you were. And there were some things that I saw in that room that were very 
revolutionary in my opinion to what the strength world and the in the collegiate and professional strength world was doing or at least what i had been exposed to and some of those things that i still you you see us use in weight room design today uh so i want to ask you about a couple of those things sure first was you had the double-sided racks yep. and you had, you had ricky racks you had Smith. Yep. you also had some hurricanes and you had some back attacks and now my opinion a Ricky rack, a Smith machine, a back, and, and I'm sorry, a hurricane are all from the same genesis of style of movement. They just seem to be an upward and downward extension of kind of difficulty. Is that, was that intentional or how did you, because I thought it's very interesting. The room was very, very simple, but very specific that you had at the Bucks. Yeah, it's only 2,000 square feet. So that was um, question, right. Yeah, that was and, and that was fine as long as you didn't have players in there. We started getting people in there; it got real crowded. It but, did, but you know, we, I remember talking with you at that point. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. So go ahead. What were you saying? No, 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 please. What we were talking about while we were there was I remember the room being very crowded, very cramped. Yep. And maybe it was just your ability to be such a great sports psychologist and make the best of every situation. But I remember you telling me and some of the other uh, the other athletes that you liked how cramped it was. And we're talking again, two thousand square foot weight room for an NFL team, because it brought an intimacy to the players. They yep. they fed off of each other's energy, literal electric, you know, energy between them because athletes were so close. They're breathing on each other. They're sweating on each other. They're yelling at each other. You could smell each other, and there was this tribal thing that you had going there that I believe that people have missed in today's super rooms, these 40,000, 50,000 square foot monsters that you, you spread the athletes out so much that you lose that literal electricity in the room. And there was electricity in that room when those men were training. Well, thank you for, for saying that, Bert. And I, I couldn't agree more. I, don't, I couldn't coach in one of these weight rooms today. Mm -hmm. It's too big. How do you have, you know, in, in some of them, you can't even see everybody. Right. And, and they're so far away. How are you going to correct technique or anything that you, you know, you see a flaw and you, you, you want to get there and correct it as fast as you can. And he's a long way away. Sure. And they, they, you're right. They don't have that togetherness. They don't s smell each other's sweaty T-shirts, and, yeah. and you know they they don't have the the intimacy that that you would have in a smaller weight room. Every you know there are two or three guys to a rack, and you're kind of isolated from everybody else. I I would not want that. If I did inherit one of those big weight rooms, I would shut ninety percent of it off and coach in a very small confined area. Really, and you're one of the only people I've ever heard say that. And again, I didn't know if you were just looking at the bright side of your situation, but I saw it and felt it. And, and you know, was it potentially a safety hazard with people moving around tightly? Potentially so, but I kind of looked at it and said, well, football is up in your face. You're around other men, you're breathing, you're sweating, you're bumping in and everything. And it seemed like a little bit of a, kind of a little bit like West Side Barbell when it was real tight and there was a lot of, a lot of guys and testosterone and you look and you go, okay, I could see how that created a situation that bred success that maybe some people are missing now that you had dialed to a T. And I always thought that was so interesting how you had that just, just, just really dialed in. Well, you know, Bert, I just think that you can work harder when you see your teammates working hard and when you're right there in the in the heat of the moment, yes. When you're right there, and it, you got a bunch of people in there together, and you, it's almost like you don't dare slack off because you don't want to embarrass yourself in front of your teammates. There's no and I, I just think, like you said, I think there's an energy that flows kind of from person to person that doesn't happen when they're so scattered out. Right. Heck, I've even seen some rooms these days. I was talking to a coach this morning. He said one of his first workouts when he got to a university, it's a giant room. 
every athlete had his own earbud headphones and listened to his own music. And I said, man, how do you have congruency of direction? How do you have, I mean, even if it's a song that you don't like, at least we're all still bumping to the same rhythm and you're bringing yep. a, harmo a, a harmonious approach to this is a team. This is a tribe. This is our war music. These are our war sounds. These are our, this is what we're doing as a team. And I think if you start segmenting people out so much now, obviously COVID stuff aside, but in normal times, I think that was a miss. All right. We didn't have earphones or earbuds <laughs> or whatever you were coming. We didn't do that. Didn't have cell phones. Right. I mean, that just wasn't going to happen. And if I inherited a weight room that had TVs, they were coming out the first day. Were they? Yes, sir. Now, how about music? Was was music going, or was it, it was it sounds of battle? Was it coaching, yelling, and grunting? And all of the above. But I'll tell you this, Bert. I, as I would tell them. The senior player in the room at that time had control of the music, but I had control of the volume and the language. Perfect. And uh, I wasn't gonna listen to any of this, what do you call it, virtual stuff? Is it, what do they call it? Uncensored or something. And I, I remember sometimes, I would, you know, I could learn to tune it out. I'd go crazy if I didn't, but anyway, and I would just, Sometimes notice all the players grinning. And then I so saw I would listen to the music and sure enough, it was one of those sure. virtual ones. And I would go over and head right to the to the uh receiver, pop the disc out, and the paper, oh no, come on, coach, come on, coach. And I'd fold it in half and hand it to the player. Oh, coach, come on, don't do that. And I hey, you knew when you put it in there. You knew. you knew what was going to happen. Right. So yeah, it was still anyway. kind of hard for ship. Well, I, I don't know about that, but it was, you know, it, there were certain things, or well, there were a lot of things we were going to do my way. Hey, it, it worked. Another, another question of mine, that was the first, one of the first weight rooms I saw that had all bumper plates and only bumper plates in there. Even to the fact, now we do here at Sornex a lot, and a lot of people have kind of copied that, that idea of having all bumper plates and small change in their weight rooms. You went one step further, and I remember you had 20 kilo bumper plates and Olympic bars and small change. That was it. You didn't have any 10s. You didn't have any 15s. You had 20 kilo bumper plates and small change. And I, and I remember asking, I said, and you said, Bert, I remember it was great. You said, it's like training a horse, make the horse, give the horses uh, their deci the decision you want them to make, make that the easiest decision for them. You said, so if I make it where everywhere they could just put the plates back is the right place, then I've cut down my managerial time. I've made my coaching easier. I could put more effort into coaching them. And you had a ton, a literal multiple tons of 20 kilo bumper plates and small change plates. And, and you were pretty open about, hey, they're either gonna go a plate or they're gonna go kind of somewhere in between, but I'm not super worried about the weight. What was the mindset behind that? Well, Bert, at that point in time, I had had no interaction with the team when y'all came to, to right. set up our weight room and to equip it. I had no interaction. I knew that their prior program had been a machine program. So I was not worried about the amount of weight at first. Sure. I was worried about how. Okay. Technique, form, speed of movement. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I was concerned with initially. And then of course, you know, pretty soon, you know, you better start lifting some weight. Sure. You can be over there working on technique for six months. And this other guy is, you know, a, just maybe not quite as good as you with technique, but he's cleaning, you know, 330 and you're cleaning 135. Well, <laughs> he's going to put you in the hospital when you play. That's right. That's right. And, and, and it was interesting. I saw that, which I thought was just brilliant. And another thing that I saw was the, the the rack of dumbbells that you had when you walked in the room was on the right side. There was a stack of Airx mats. Yep. And I can't remember if it was 30 pairs of 25 or 25 pairs of 30s, but it was something along those lines. And I remember even when you were ordering it, 
you told us what you wanted and it didn't make sense until I got there and I watched. Tell us a little bit about the mindset about the Airx pads because you're one of the first coaches I saw that used them a lot barefoot and what you were doing with those dumbbells. Okay. Well, first of all, Bert, we, in your football career, what did you play? I didn't. I, I did not play football. I was only track and field or weightlifting. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, if I'd been the coach at uh, where you went, you'd have been playing football. You had no choice. Trying to get me to play. Um, I understand. But anyway, Bert, if you're a lineman, say an offensive lineman, really what the defender is trying to do is – to get you off balance, right. especially on pass rush. The defender is trying, whether it's with fakes, whether it's with the power of his slaps or his hands, get you off balance. So I thought it was important <clears throat> to work on players' balance. So we would stand on those air X pads. We'd go one minute, eyes open, each leg. And then when they got good at that, we'd start, we'd go one minute eyes closed. And then we'd start doing dumbbell exercises. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd do dumbbell snatches or dumbbell clean and press, uh, dumbbell, oh shoot. Oh, we would do some of the shoulder exercises. Um, it and like some of the Jaboric complexes that you were doing. Is that accurate? What? Well, not really, because we weren't working on any type of strength or form at that point. Okay. We were standing on one leg doing those exercises. And again, when we started with the dumbbells, then they would be one minute each leg, eyes open. Mm. Then when they could do the exercises pretty well, I would move a player to one minute each leg, eyes closed. Wow. Doing dumbbell cleaning press, again, dumbbell snatch front raises, just anything to make balance more difficult. And then the last stage of it was combat. Mm. The players would be on one leg, eyes open, and I would then try to punch the player or, you know, or slap or punch or anything. And, of course, he was trying to block my punch. Oh, wow. And that was pretty good, except I, at the end of every day, I was cut and bruised. And I think some players might have accidentally missed their punch on purpose and hit me in the face. <laughs> I I think that was done intentionally. You think? Anyway. Oh, I no doubt. Anyway, and uh, but I thought that was really really good stuff. Did you, the, I thought I think it's brilliant. And the, I remember I think I even have some old pictures of the Keyshawn Johnsons and some guys like that doing that. I just didn't have enough context behind it to understand the method behind it. Now, is that one of those things you were happy with the results and saw unique, it saw distinct results? And would you do it again if you were in the coaching world again? I would do it right now. You know, that's something you can't quantify. You can only go by what you see and what the player or his position coach tells you. Right. It, it, you know, with, if you're cleaning, you know, you, you, you cleaned 315 last test, and in 340 this test, then you know you're improving. The, uh, <clears throat> what we would see with the players is their ability to perform those exercises or those regimens better. Mm -hmm. But, again, as far as results on the field, we'd have to go by what we saw and what they and their coaches said. And, right. yes, I'd do that. I would do that. First thing, first, first thing, thing, order the Eric's pads. It seemed like they'd walk through the door, kick off their shoes, go right to the Eric's pads or Eric's pads and dumbbells. And again, were the, were the dumbbells, do you remember if they were 25s or 30s? I can't remember. Nope. Don't remember. Okay. But I guess from what I'm understanding was the weight wasn't necessarily significant. No, no, not at all. It wasn't supposed to be taxing in terms of weight, just taxing in terms of balance. Gotcha, gotcha. And then I knew it seemed like you guys went to Olympic lifts or Olympic lift variations, and then into a strength lift, whether it's a yep. squat or something, and then into some auxiliary lifts, uh, maybe some heavier dumbbell work, some auxiliary back attack, things like that, or uh, or some some core ab stuff. Is that kind absolutely, of absolutely, 
uh, most explosive exercises first, then strength exercises, and then I call it exercises of local effect. Okay. That is whether it's, you know, abs, neck, things that did not work uh, a large segment of your body, but that were still very worthwhile as right. both abs and neck are. Sure. Oh, do you have any, uh, any specific, what would you say some of your favorite exercises were? I would assume some cleans and squats. Absolutely. Those are the two exercises that beyond any shadow of a doubt, improvability in any sport that I know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask players over the many years that I coach, I would ask at different times during a year, I would ask, what is it that we've done in the weight room that helps you the most on the field? Mm -hmm. And Bert, if I ask 250 players, I only received less than five answers that weren't either A, cleans, B, squats, or C, cleans and squats. Really? Maybe five players had a different viewpoint. Wow. Now, was it hard? Uh, because that was a period of time where like more of a hit training and machine training had a, a heavy popularity as well. Was it hard taking a collegiate athlete from maybe a program that wasn't as heavy with barbell squats and cleans and teach them those exercises as well as kind of sell them on them? Actually, that was fun uh, because, again, that was the way we were going to do it. And um, no, because, you know, rookies don't know it all yet. Yeah. They, so uh, usually they're very compliant. And I would explain to them the reasons behind those exercises and behind the program based on ground-based exercises, explosive exercises, and in particular, cleaning and squatting. If you do those two, it's hard to screw up the rest. It really is. You you build a machine or a build up build an athlete that's powerful, reactive, and strong. You could kind of go in any direction, can't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, of course, there needs to be thought and planning behind everything you do. But again, the, those two exercises are the foundation. Absolutely. Um, were you a coach that liked to see big numbers, or did you like to see velocity intent, or 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 aggression of action in the weight room? Where, where were your, some of your measuring uh, sticks on that? Okay, I, I like to see violence of action. I like to see speed. I like to see big numbers. I liked it all. <laughs> and one thing that um, Angel Spazov, the great Bulgarian coach, sure. taught me that we did that might have been a little different is on our squats, down under control, up as fast as possible, rattle the plates at the top. Right. Rattle the plates. You know, naturally, when people pass a sticking point and you have better leverage, more muscles involved, et cetera, they kind of do what I call coast into the finish line. Yes. And really, the last six or eight inches of a squat is really where you use a squat on the field. Sure. You're not ever in a full squat position and you as a thrower, did you, what'd you throw shot discus uh, hammer? Uh, yeah. Hammer for the most part. Yeah. That last okay. few degrees, that was where I lived. Absolutely. So it made no sense to do the least work there. And if the weight was then proportionately lighter because of leverage, then go faster, sure. go fast, rattle the plates. That is, that's an essential element. Essential element. And so Angel, he was a strength and conditioning coach at Texas. Is that accurate? Yes, he was. And then he went off into the, into the private sector. Right, right. I've heard, I never got to work with him specifically, but I've heard his name brought up multiple times with. Brilliant man. Brilliant. Another coach uh, that I had heard a lot about that was a bit before my time and the opportunity uh, to meet with him for myself, not to meet with him, never arrived. Uh, but Gregory Goldstein, 
Oh. And, and I, you know, so Bill Gillespie now works with us here at Sornex, part of our education division. And so he speaks super highly of Gregory. And I remember, and I believe it was 1992, when I was in high school, my father coming back, I believe from, from your place when you were with the Giants, right? And you guys <laughs> brought Goldstein in. Is that accurate? Yeah. Bert, it was, I don't know, 88, 89, somewhere in there. I just heard through the grapevine or read in a magazine that a Russian coach had immigrated to the United States. Mm -hmm. And he was the, you know, it was during the time of communism and it was part of the Soviet Union then, but he was a coach of what is now Belarus. Okay. The country of Belarus. Well, he came to the United States and, uh, but I didn't know where he was. And I called everybody I knew to see if they knew where he was. And nobody had any idea. So I mean, this went on for several months, Bert. And then finally, I forget who told me, but I found out <clears throat> he lived in Staten Island, which was not even, which was 10 miles from <laughs> Giant Stadium. You he could have been in Canada or Mexico. He could have been in California, anywhere. 10 miles from me. Wow. So I was able to then track him down and he was very receptive to teaching me. I immediately called my great friend, Rob Panarello, and we would go over to either Staten Island or to the Jewish community house in Brooklyn where Mr. Goldstein worked. And Bert, I think at one time I had 10 legal pads filled with my notes from Mr. Goldstein. I can't imagine. Al Miller, who along with Rob are my are very, very close friends. I mean, real, you know, once in a lifetime friends. I told Al about Mr. Goldstein. <clears throat> and so Al started flying in from Denver on weekends for weekend seminars with Mr. Goldstein. I would leave after work on Friday, you know, get into Newark, check into a hotel, then Saturday morning, be at Giant Stadium, spend the day, spend the day Sunday, take a late flight back to Denver, do the same thing again. He did that three or four times. Wow. So I think that was, that's just, that's an example of why Al Miller is such a great coach. Sure. But Mr. Goldstein, <clears throat> Bert, this was in all the Russian literature. But I'd never attached any importance to it, and I, nobody that I know had either, hmm. is the variation of the volume. Right. Well, a crucial factor that is in preventing overtraining, allowing for progress over a longer period of time. Right. That was critical. He, I mean, he taught us a lot of things, but I think that system of training was probably the most valuable. Really, and and that was, from what I remember, I saw a picture the other day. I'll have to send it to you. I believe it was yourself, uh, Pops. Richard was there. Um, Dave Williams, uh, Bill Gillespie. There were a number of coaches there that were you know known coaches, and and they were all with with Goldstein. I have some pictures of Goldstein doing some different seated good mornings and some different things. Yep some pictures of and it's it's funny that I remember hearing about that in high school and then this name keeps popping up later in life I'm 43 years old and I keep hearing Goldstein's name and then after we hired Bill one of the first things he said he, he said that kind of funny story he said he was sitting there listening to Goldstein and he said that it would take I can't remember I, I said maybe like 40 hours or something along those lines for him to create a program for someone it was some monster amount of time Yep. And then after Bill said three days later, after listening to how you do it, he looked, turned to the person beside him. He said, I couldn't do this in 20 years, figure out how to get all the information that he put in there. Uh, and he said, but over the last 35 years, he's done it so often. He said the fastest he ever wrote a workout based upon those principles was like 13 minutes. He's got it down because he's wrote oh, yep. so long. And now Bill just uh, he has the second heaviest bench press of all time right now. He just benched over a thousand pounds at 60 years old, drug free. You are kidding. Not at all. He just went for right at 1100, I believe, which would be the heaviest bench press of all time. And he's still drug free at 60 years old. They're, they're rating it as the, as the 
best bench of ever. And part of what he says, he goes, that Goldstein clinic 30 something years ago, opened my eyes to how to train. He goes, and I, through, through the volume manipulation and things like that, he goes, I've been able to continue my, my success. Oh, I will say, you know, as I would tell players as they got a little older, that the first thing that God takes away from you is your speed. Right. The strength you can keep a lot longer as Coach Gillespie is a prime example. Prime example. A thousand pounds at the age of 60. Yes, sir. Incredible. Incredible. And, and I, speaking of what you said about the, the God taking away speed first, what would you say would be about the maximum – that, that an athlete could really expect to have that, that kind of blinding ankle breaking speed. I, I don't understand the question. Okay. Uh, say like, would you say 27, 28 is when they start losing speed general athletes? Yes. Yes. And training is the key to the uh, angle of the hill that they're going down. Right, right. How 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 much of the brakes have been put on to keep them from sliding down the hill? Exactly. The, the less you train, the sharper the angle going down. In other words, you go down a lot faster. The <laughs> the more you train, and the more and more importantly, the more intelligently you train, then the more gentle the slope, and right. the longer you're able to be at or very close to your peak. Mm hmm. Yes, I, I would agree with that. And I guess like you had just said, the more intelligently you train, I'll kind of spin off of that for a second. What do you think is one of the bigger mistakes that people make in training for longevity or athletes make that hampers their their ability to to reach their potential or keep it? I think this I, I think too many coaches are afraid of the players. Interesting. I think there's too much of, you know, uh, or just get a good workout in. Just, you just get a, and without, hey, this is what we're doing. This is why. And you really, you owe it to yourself to try this because it's helped too many people for mm -hmm. you just to discard it out of hand or reject it out of hand. Okay. So, so I think too many coaches are afraid to demand of the players. Real players want to be pushed. They want to have a lot expected of them, and they want to be coached. Phonies resent that. Right. So, so have an intent for each training session, but also uh, holding, holding accountability for that intent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, Bert, I, I think another thing that perhaps we could have could all do better is – making it too easy for the older player. Now, at past age of 30, volume should gradually decline, but intensity is always going up. Ah. Always. Sure. From, from, a, from a weight standpoint, they can handle the, the poundage, you feel. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you ask any physical therapist, Makes sense. most of the sports injuries that they treat come from overuse uh, and not from one-time events. Not, not from acute injury. As exactly. Wow. Exactly. That's, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I'm sure you've, of course, you've been with so many amazing athletes throughout the years. I mean, what would you say, what would you, who would you say is one of the most impressive athletes you've ever worked with or maybe one of the freakiest things that you've seen on the athletic field or the weight room. I mean, you've seen some, you've seen the best of the best and been a part of their success. Well, he wasn't the best athlete. Although if he were listening, he might break in and dispute that, but he wasn't the best athlete, but the hardest worker I ever had was Phil Sims. Okay. Our quarterback with the Giants. Yep. My last year there, Phil was 37 and he was still trying to get faster. Wow. We, we would go out during the season and we'd run sprints in Giant Stadium in the pitch dark and, you know, still trying to get faster and more explosive at the age of 37. Uh, but he did an off-season program during the season. Did he really? Yes, he did. 
Yes, he did. Now, he was a quarterback. He didn't have, you know, the physical load that other players did. Um, and football was a different game back then. Mm -hmm. How so? Well, today you only go out in pants 12 times during the season. You can't have two a days. There's no way to develop a young lineman now because hmm. he can't go out in pads. So uh, there is, and during the season, there's very little hitting now. Right. Boys, with Coach Parcells, he felt that they had to be battle hardened. And so that meant, you know, really tough training camps, very hmm. tough. Uh, you know, a lot of contact. We'd never take people to the ground when we tackled, but lots of full speed contact. Okay. And doing it is doing it game tempo and with game rest between plays. Hmm. So condition so, level was incredible. Well, uh, because with the way he structured practice, you got in game shape. Mm -hmm. You know, really as a conditioning coach, what you can do is get them in shape to get in shape. Right. To, to get them to the, the camp and get them to practice, and then the practice kind of takes over? Yes, it makes it more uh, – you get more game ready by doing things you, you know, that you can't do in the offseason. Right. Do you see any injuries or any um, – insufficiencies that, that, that are typical within athletes now that maybe are because of that shift? It, for me, again, I didn't play football, but I've just been around it for so long. It seems like there's many more hamstring injuries than I remember hearing or reading about. Now, is that there more are reported? Or do you think there's been a change of the athlete or what they do during the day? I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of ideas out there. I'd love to hear your insight. Well, Bert, first of all, in the NFL, that's the toughest job in the profession now because let's just say your team doesn't make the playoffs. It's almost four months before you can work with the players again. Mm. Four months. And so a lot of the players hire gurus that – and if you're going to pay somebody to train you, then he is he, – he can't charge you money to have you do things that you do with your strength coach. He's got to do something different. Okay. And of course, the program that your strength coach has prescribed for you is no good. It's behind the times. I've got something a lot better. Right. So right. then you have four months really of no contact with the players or very little. Then you have them for two weeks uninterrupted. Then they start. Uh, position meetings and on the field drills with their coaches. So that usually impacts the running with some places and the lifting in a lot of places. Then they have the OTAs, which are, you know, that those are jog throughs and shorts. Right. Well, in a, in a lot of places, then that eliminates the running entirely and it really constricts the lifting. So the strength coach in the NFL has two uninterrupted weeks in the offseason. So pro players, and then after the OTAs, they go back to their gurus mm. and do something entirely different. So there's usually very little continuity of thought in wow. what the NFL players are doing. And uh, again, I sympathize with NFL strength coaches. I know I could not coach effectively with two uninterrupted weeks during off season. Right. Like you said, the continuity of thought, I think, is a very interesting way to put it because you kind of, I would think you lose your mission statement. You lose the culture of what you've created in the gym, in the weight room as a team. Um, I can see there being a lot of detriment to, to that style of, that style of training environment. Absolutely. And if you're, if, if a player hires you to train him, you know, a lot of these guys, I'm sure, are a little hesitant to push too hard because a yeah. player can just walk right out the door on you. Don't want to be the guy who hurt the guy. Don't want to be the guy that hurt him or that makes him mad. Sure. You know, by pushing him too hard. So, 
and that that's of I'm not trying to paint all personal trainers with the same brush, sure. but I, I think that is, those are definitely factors. Yeah. And, and in a way, those guys have a hard role as well because they're kind of up again. I mean, almost both sides, the, the, the hired strength coach from the team, as well as an independent contractor are, are almost in some ways set up to fail. They're both well, given some. Yeah, but Bert, there's one difference. Mm-hmm. If the team goes two and fourteen, the personal trainer doesn't get fired. <laughs> Great point. Yeah, big, Great big difference. Point. Yeah, and so would you say back in those older days, you didn't have those other entities outside, and you you had those athletes with a more rigorous and consistent schedule? Yes. As a matter of fact, our early days with the Giants, we had twenty-one weeks in the off season. Twenty-one. Now, if you can't do s- some real good in that period of time, you don't deserve your job. Oh, 100 percent And I look back and, and I mean college has changed so much since I was there in the mid-90s. But you know, when I was there, we had two weeks off a year. And that was if you made the indoor nationals, you got a, a week off afterwards. And if you made the outdoor nationals, you got a week off afterwards. Other than that, your 52 weeks a year is go time. And yep. our program was very invasive, very committed. I mean, we lifted, we threw five days a week. I'm sorry, we threw four to five days a week. We lifted four days a week, 52 weeks a year. And that we had the volume, we had this, we, we cleaned twice a week, snatched twice a week, squatted twice a week, bench twice a week, and, and then did all the pull variations. And now you, you die by volume, but if you can make it, you're going to be great. And yep. that, it was almost a part of that old Hungarian, Bulgarian, Eastern Bloc style system was here's the dosage of exercise that you must take to be good. If you can make it, you will be good. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a different animal. And I, I see now that, that they're not allowed to do that. You know, whether we were actually allowed to do it at that point, I don't know either, but <laughs> there, there might have been some, a few, long, a few longer weeks than there should be back in the day, but I don't know. I'm okay with it. Yeah, yeah, you, you wouldn't change a thing if, go, if you no, could go back. No, I'd, I'd probably eat more if I could. And I try yeah. to eat good at that point. What, what do you consider to be the high point or the golden age of, of this profession? Do you think, do you think uh, we've gotten away from some of the things that built it? Or do you think that we're moving in some interesting new directions? Listen, I know, I don't know everybody, but I know a number of, of strength coaches. I started to say younger, but they're all younger than me. But <laughs> uh, that, that really do things in what I consider the right way. They're coaching the players. The players aren't coaching them. Mm. They do the right things, the things that give results, and they care about the players. And that's an overused statement about caring about the players. Right. And you can't tell them you care. You got to show them. Right. And I, 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 that to me is so instrumental in having any success is when the players know that you care about them, they'll move mountains for you. So anyway, I know a number of strength coaches that, that I think have the, the right stuff. Um, but I, I think a, a difference today is those warehouse size weight rooms. And then at least in football, and hopefully this is going away, but the clowns on the sideline, mm. that is just, that's disgraceful to the profession. Mm. Call attention to yourself. You know, nobody bought a ticket to see you. They paid to see the players. Right. And to do things that call attention to yourself, again, to me, that's just shameful. And I'm, in, I'm embarrassed for them. I'm embarrassed for the profession. Yeah. yeah, it's it's certainly a different time. Um, you were saying before about caring. I wrote that and you asked, said about the players caring or players knowing that you care. I believe, and I also have had other coaches tell me that you're one of the best sports psychologists that's ever been a strength coach. How do you connect those players where they know you care 
and you know, I haven't heard you get really loud before. Um, and, and you and Al Miller remind me a lot of one another, generally caring, somewhat soft-spoken. I'm sure you can be hard when you need to be, but both of you have a, an ability to, as an athlete, and I met you when I was an athlete, I would have wanted to run through a wall for you and, and Coach Miller and some, some other gentlemen like that. And in, in my opinion, that's sports psychology and knowing how to, I would say control, but, but, but change an athlete to want to do a certain, what are any, what's, what's the gold net? What's the, what's the, uh, the secret ingredient of that? I mean, of well, course, I'm here, but a lot of people care, but they can't get the, they can't get the result. I, I think, um, Bert, if I can just relate a phone call I had with one of my former players is a kid named Van Phillips. He was a real, real good high school linebacker. Mm -hmm. Wasn't big enough to play in college, but he had an excellent high school career. We yeah. hadn't talked in probably 20 years at this time. So one afternoon, phone rings his van. So we had a lot of catching up to do. Of course. And I asked Van if his kids were having a good sports experience in high school. He said, yes, sir, they've got some good coaches, but nobody makes them feel special. Mm. Now, you know, the conversation went on, but I knew that I needed to file that away in my mind and think about it when we hung up. Mm. And when, I, when we did conclude the, the, the call and I thought about what he said about making them feel special, I realized that's the key to everything. Mm. that's the key to everything. Make them feel special. Because if they don't think they can achieve, then they're not going to achieve. So you have to give them, you have to believe in them and give them the confidence to succeed. Right. And you have to let them know you believe in them. Then on top of that, when their performance is not what they're capable of, then when you get on them, they don't take it as you being a, a pest or a nag or a bother. It's Kosori knows that I can do better. Right. He really believes in me. And he's right. I can do better. Um, the narrative is, is positive, but if they're not living up to it, they're told they're not living up to their potential versus you suck or you're a dog. Yes, yes, yes. You know, Kids, and I consider pro football players kids for the most part, they have very shallow self-esteem, mm. very shallow. And you can crush a kid really easily, especially if they have any respect for you. Right. Bert, this might be, this will take a minute, but it, this might be worthwhile. I think that with any coaching player, teacher and student, whatever, there are four stages in a profitable relationship the first one is fear okay now they have to be afraid of being either called out or losing their position or being embarrassed in front of their peers or something they have to have some fear of consequences yes sir now over time that subsides mm -hmm. and it somewhat morphs into professional respect you know this coach soaring boy i tell you what i don't want to mess with that dude you know he's serious Mm -hmm. But, you know, he really knows his stuff. Right. He's helping me. I'm going to do what that dude says now because he is really good. Then the third phase, and there's no timeline on any of these, is personal respect. And it's the fear, the professional respect remain there, although fear subsides over time. Mm -hmm. And the, the personal respect is, you know, this Kosorin really believes in me. Nobody's ever talked to me the way that he has. He believes I can do something. Man, nobody's ever told me that before. Well, I'm going to do my best because I don't want to let Coach Soren down. And then the fourth and the ultimate is this. I like this feeling of doing my best. Mm. Now I'm doing my best not only in the weight room but in class. I'm going to do the best in everything that I can in everything that I do because I don't want to let myself down. Mm. 
Mm. That's when that's the happens. ultimate. When they reach that stage, you know that you have really had some of some part in helping a kid change his whole outlook on life by making him feel yeah. special. Absolutely brilliant, and I'm, I'm taking notes, and I'm going to put that on my whiteboard in here. I have three young kids, as you well know, and I'm trying to figure out how to turn them into to, 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 to successful people in this world. And, and uh, when, you're, when you're long gone, Coach, long, 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 long time from now, my, my, hopefully my kids will be teaching those lessons to their kids. So, Thank you very much, bro. Thank yeah. you. And, and let's don't be talking about long gone to an old fellow now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a couple, a couple of things. So, man, that was awesome. So you, you built that care and those, those levels. And I would say those had to be a secret ingredient of those championship that you had. Was there any other type of magic that those specific teams had or that, or that you said, man, when we have, when we're vibrating on this harmony, this, this is, this is when we have the, the recipe to, to go all the way. Did you know that? Well, Bert, I think I think this part of caring about them is caring about them other than as a football player. Mm -hmm. Care about their grades, asking kidding them about their girlfriend. Sure. You know, boy, that pretty girl like that. What, what, what in the world is she doing with you? She yeah. do a lot better than you. <laughs> you know, just just you know, silly things like that. But you know, if their mama's been sick, check on her daily. Yeah. Uh, and then I would accept no part of a player's success, but I would accept every bit of their failure. Mm. So it was their success was personal to me. And, um, you know, there'd be, I, I can remember in San Francisco, my last job on a cut down day, there are always some guys that gave you everything they had. And it just wasn't enough. Right. And, you know, they would go, come by to see you, to say goodbye. And they are the ones who just had a, you know, a devastating blow to their career. And I should have been consoling them. Well, I'd start crying and they'd have to console me. <laughs> just no, just not, just no softy. But, you know, um, I just felt like I had failed the player. Right. And so, again, his success was his. His failure was mine. That's the way I looked at it. Wow. That's, in, that's incredible. I mean, that is a leadership gem. Uh, and now did you – my next question would be, who were your mentors? And did you learn that from, from a mentor or did you – did your ability, your emotional intelligence just kind of pick up on that? Well, the greatest mentor I ever had uh, was Coach Parcells. Okay. He might not have been the smartest, but he is the wisest man I've ever known. Really? Uh, also. Then, then professionally, Alvin Roy mm -hmm. was probably my greatest influence and mentor, along with Mr. Ricky and Clyde Emmerich. Of course, Mr. Goldstein was a great mentor professionally and technically. Uh, but guys like Al Miller, who, listen, if stealing ideas was against the law, I've stolen so much from him, I would, I would be in jail for about 300 years. <laughs> so anyway, he's been a, always a, a great help to me. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And, you know, those would probably lead to – Rob Panarella mm -hmm. is the greatest resource any strength coach could have. And I've asked him so many stupid questions, um, and he always answers them patiently and, uh, you know, never says, hey, that was a dumb question, even though it was. <laughs> but those are guys that are – very have been very very impactful on my life coach mike nolan my last coach in san francisco wonderful coach and a better person so i would say those were probably the biggest influences on me oh that's that's incredible. i'll tell you one more i'll tell you one more bob knight okay 
basketball coach at Indiana. Sure. Yeah. What was uh, what 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 did you learn from him that was uh, just a, kind of an interesting for a basketball coach? Don't accept anything less than a player's best. Yeah. And I learned from him that, and I had kind of I'd been doing this, but to see from somebody as successful as him that just reinforced it is that I thought it was my job as quickly as I could to determine what each student or player was capable of and demand that every day. Mm. Not what they were capable of that day or what they thought they were capable of, but their very best. So if a player came to me and said, hey, coach, uh, man, I had a cold last night, didn't get a lot of sleep. I don't know what I can do today. I said, you know, you're exactly right. We don't know just how much you can live because it's going to be the best workout you've ever had. Or sometimes if it was a player that was, you know, maybe not as tough, I would just, I'm just tell him, look, I don't want to hear your excuses. You're going to have a great workout. So right. you may as well, may as well decide that's what it's going to be. Because I'm going to get – if you don't want to give it, I'm going to get it out of you. Right. And I think that's part of your responsibility, too, to the kids. There are very few that want to give it every day. So on the days that they don't, you got to get it out of them. Uh, that's, that's brilliant. Man, I know you've, uh, you've written a, a book or two, haven't you? I have, and uh, the, the most recent one was titled The System That – Al Miller and Rob Panarello and I wrote together. Mm -hmm. And um, these were the principles that Mr. Goldstein taught us. Okay. And we just wanted to kind of leave, leave that as a farewell present, present for people in the profession uh, because it's a system of training that, frankly, even though Mr. Goldstein told us over 30 years ago, I haven't seen people in America doing it yet. Wow. Until it's the people that have either read the book or that, you know, that we have, you know, personally taught the system to. Right. Well, I can't wait to purchase that. Where, where can people find that book to purchase? You can purchase it uh, through Amazon, you know, the uh, E edition, or you can order it through Amazon or on target publications. Got it. On target publications. I, I thought Pop might have ordered one before, but I'm going to order four or five of them today because I know we like to keep uh, have our, our our top brass here have a, the the best of every book, but also I want to make sure we have one in the Sornex library. And you never know when you have to gift one to somebody, so I want to make sure that we support you and 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 I want to read the system because I know enough of the context and I know enough of you. If 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 you gentlemen wrote it, then it's it's absolute gold. Well. Thank you very much, but Mr. Goldstein taught it to us, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, this this came from him. And I'll, I'll just say this, Bert, that of all the people that I know that have committed to this system, nobody has ever gone back to what they used to do before. Wow, wow, well, uh, there's no better endorsement than that. Uh, well, is there anything else, Coach Parker, that you'd like to? maybe bring up or, or, uh, or, or touch on or, you know, observations you're seeing in the field or things that you wish you could have done differently or. Oh, Bert, things that I wish I could have done differently or better. How many days do we have? Here? <laughs> you have all the time you need. Yeah. Well, I, there's so many things I wish that I had done better. Um, I was pretty good at loving the players. I would, I would love the players. And I was pretty good at pushing the players. Other than that, I wasn't, you know, very good at anything. But um, I would just say this, that first of all, Bert, good coaches coach weights. Great coaches coach people. And there's a big difference. There's a huge difference. And if anybody is interested, uh, I love having the opportunity to talk to other coaches. And so my phone number, 727-415-8236. And I would welcome calls from 
any coach for whatever the reason, you know, for whatever they have questions about or, or whatever they think I might could be of some small help to them with call, call anytime, call as often as you like. Coach, that is a, a testament to who you are. And, and I've, I've heard you give your phone number for out for the last 20 years. And it, it's just, it just shows that your passion for this cuts all the way to the bone and that you're wanting to give back. And, and uh, it's, it's very touching because you're doing it, you're doing it for the right reasons you did. And you did it for the right reasons. And I appreciate that as, as uh, you know, I'd say a, a peer, although uh, not to your level, I would say as, as a peer in the strength world, uh, I'm, I'm honored to get to spend this time with you. I really appreciate that. Now we're not on the same level. You're several levels ahead of me. I promise you that. But I do appreciate your kind words very much. They, they warm my heart. Yes, sir, Coach. Well, uh, is there any way I get you your phone number? I, I guess you probably don't. You do social media. I think you're on Facebook. Is that right? I am. Yes, sir. And uh, and and well, great. If there's any other ways, that you, I mean, you have your phone number, so I, I'm sure people need to get a hold of you. They can. But I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, from from Pops and I and everyone here at Sornex, <clears throat> thank you for what you've done in the industry and thank you for spending time with us today and thank you for just opening up that that brilliant brain in, in your heart and uh and just letting us see inside some of the uh some of the gold there thank you thank you so very very much bird i really appreciate that and, and you, again my best to your dad yes sir take care of yourself and uh saw so sign us off so that was coach johnny parker I'm Bert Soren. That was the Be Legendary podcast. And as always, love yourself, love someone, and go be legendary. Thank you.